Hey everybody, this is Scott from Lawrence Hypnotherapy and welcome to this brand new training called How to Cure Depression. And so I'm Scott Lawrence from Lawrence Hypnotherapy and I've seen over 4,000 now clients with various conditions, whether it's depression, anxiety, insomnia, addictions, smoking, marijuana, alcohol, food addiction and weight loss. And so this is my own personal, you could say, um, experience that what we're giving. And so it, this is just so exciting to be able to give you this stuff. And so let's get straight into it. But how to cure depression? You may be somebody who's like a therapist or an NLP expert or a coach or an expert and you're helping people to cure depression themselves. Or you might be somebody who's basically wanting to understand more about themselves and just want to know like, well, how do I get out of this? Like the walls have been so high for so long. I just don't know exactly how to escape this prison in my own mind. And the good news is that it is curable. Like I know that that's, a debate that's out there. There are people who say it's just something you have to live with. To me, which feels like really sad that this is something that people tend to believe. That's not true. That I mean, that in my experience, people get cured all of the time from depression. Like basically, happiness is it's the default state until one of three things happen. And so that's why I want to get you um, into the training for this week. So these four circles represent. Um, Lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, and then the offer to see us live. Um, so let's get straight into the first lesson for today on how to cure depression. So what is depression? This map has a fair bit in it that we'd like to unpack. So I'm just going to explain it part by part, and then we're going to zoom in to talk about each part individually and separately. So imagining this scale of high energy and low energy so often some people will have energy that is high other people or at times the same person can have energy that's low so anxiety tends to relate to more high energy they're overclocked they're overworked depression tends to relate more to low energy they're flat and they find themselves not being able to move so if you could think of like say a person who has depression they can also become anxious later often in the same day, sometimes in the same hour. So they can keep moving between high energy and low energy. They can keep moving between um, anxiety and depression. They can be like the ping pong ball that keeps getting hit from both sides. But they leave depression to become anxious and they can leave anxiety to become depressed. Sometimes they can leave depression to become happy and then leave the happy to become depressed. Sometimes they can leave anxiety to become at peace and sometimes they can leave peace to become anxious. So there's a lot of options that can occur here. So that's that up and down axis. Going along this way, the left and right, um, so there's past, present, and future. Anxiety tends to be imagination about the future. They're thinking about what's to come. Depression tends to be about memory of the past because they've got an internal representation of their mind. That's what the IR stands for. They've got an internal representation in the mind of something that's happened, something that they've done, something that somebody else did, something that happened to them. So depression's like not enough energy thinking about the past, and anxiety is like too much energy thinking about the future. So now let, let's zoom into these one by one. So we're gonna go through the high energy, the low energy, then talking about memory, the sensory presence, and then the imagination of the future. So just starting with the first one. So memory of the past, basically like what we're talking about, are internal representations. So a person, when they wake up in the morning, often even depressed people, they don't wake up depressed until they get dressed in their thoughts. When they get dressed in their thoughts, what's happening is they wake up feeling fine and then they start remembering the past in terms of representations and going, oh, yeah, that's right, my life sucks, my life's terrible, for various reasons. But unless somebody feels sick, which is different, depressed, just to really unpack all these elements, there must be an internal representation element going on with depression where they're comparing their life to someone else's life or they're comparing their life to other ways their life could be. So they're wearing their thoughts, they, they get dressed in their thoughts, and then they become 
depressed for perhaps the day or perhaps for the hour, sometimes reactively and sometimes habitually, which is different. So reactively as in something's happened to them that day that made them feel sad. Habitually is more that they've been feeling sad for so long that it's become anchored in as behaviors. So before we get too much further, I wanted to really um, point out the difference between what they call acute and chronic. So often when people hear the word chronic, they tend to think that word means really, really bad case. Like if someone has chronic depression, people tend to think that that means really bad case of depression. That's not actually how that word is used. Acute usually means something that's either just happened or it's been going on for maybe up to about three to six months. And chronic means that the condition's been going on for between three to six months or more. So chronic is when the situation is ongoing. It's been at least three to six months or more, if that makes sense. So if somebody is sad just because like reactively something's happened, let's say that they've just, um, they're going through grief. A lot of that could be re reactive because it's just happened. Or if they've just um, been told some bad news, it's just happened, that's reactive. The chronic is that the event occurred three to six months ago and they're still feeling bad about it. They're still feeling sad, they're still feeling depressed. This is where you want to treat the person to help grow and elevate them out of the depression back into joy. So let's get into these one by one. So see these three funny looking circles or just, you know, the um, traffic light looking things. Let's get into those one by one. So an internal representation, the ISE is the initial sensitizing event. So let's say something occurred in their past that caused them to become sensitive. So perhaps they were hurt, perhaps that um, money was stolen from them, perhaps they were physically attacked, perhaps that they've um, attempted to grow something for so long and it didn't work, so they've given up. But whatever it is, it's giving them this, um, this perception of the world now that their goals aren't worth trying or that they don't have the energy or the enthusiasm to move through them because an, an initial sensitizing event occurred. So the next part is what we call the RSC, the re-sensitizing event. So to begin with, something bad happened to them in their past that potentially created a trauma. They could have gone to war. The resensitizing event is when it comes, when it happens again. When it happens again, this is where it starts to become habitual for people because they find that the environment keeps bringing these sensitizing events in. Their brain learns and memorizes that the world's not a great place anymore for them. So they bring that forward into the now and then that's where they become more habitually depressed, if that makes sense. So just to kind of zoom out on that one again. So internal representations is when this isn't just the, um, the environment around them. This is now in their mind. They're remembering. So just to go up to here again, it's memory of the past and memory can be accurate or memory can be inaccurate, but it's internal representations of an initial sensitizing event, the resensitizing event or multiple, there can be like unlimited resensitizing events. The resensitizing event can be just as bad as the original, or it could just be that they're reliving it in their minds because the brain keeps bringing it up. And then that becomes in the now, that the now starts to become habitually a resensitizing event because it all becomes habit. So just to take um, a break from the rest of the map for a moment. So what I wanted to point out as to what we've just talked about and where this fits is that if a person's depressed, they're experiencing like a low energy and often thinking about the memories of the past, about a thing that happened or a thing that happened multiple times or something that's become habitual, so they're now chronically depressed. What you can do as a therapist is often that you can, whether you're doing hypnotherapy or you're doing types of coaching, you can get them to basically not time travel back into the past but to look at how these two things are stories in their minds now. So they don't live in the past, they live in the now, but the ISC and the RSC is still affecting them. Not necessarily in ways that are um, through the physical world, as in that their money was stolen, now they don't have it anymore, because that's still physical, but in, as in that they were hurt. And now in their brain, their brain has memorized that hurt and is now extra sensitive and doesn't want to kind of raise its energy level because it feels pointless. So this story, is the filter between them and the reality, the internal representation in their mind of the ISE and the RSE. 
if you can take them through a process where you can get them to imagine the past again but flip the perspective give them a perception of the past where they're not actually the victim of the past they're the victor of the past so instead of saying something happened to you something happened for you in the past instead of saying that your job was taken away from you because you're so terrible that you don't deserve the job it's that that job was taken away from you because it wasn't right for you so that it made space for you to be able to have this new job in the future if that makes sense so that's one version of how you can change the past story because it's the past story that they're getting dressed in in the morning and that's the memory past internal representation but the past present and future they interact with the person in a way because past is memory internal representations of pictures and sounds and feelings and the future well they, the future hasn't happened yet so it's really it's imagination it's a prediction either accurate or inaccurate but either way it hasn't happened yet and they're worried about things like money health and relationships so when it comes to just zooming into this next part the sensory present if a person's being affected by the sensory present whereas like the past memory was like a trauma which then became the story that the brain repeats sensory presence is because there's something ongoing that's still happening to them they became they're becoming overwhelmed because in their environment the pictures and the sounds and the feelings that are occurring right now are still affecting them they're still going on we break this down to pictures sounds and feelings because out of the five senses taste and smell tend not to be the senses that cause people too much stress they may trigger people into feeling symptoms of anxiety or depression but the symptoms basically come across as 40% of people tend to primarily represent the world to themselves in pictures 40% of people tend to primarily represent the world to themselves in feelings or kinesthetic spatial awareness emotions and 20% of people tend to represent the world to themselves in sounds or audio so that the actual painful part of the depression or the anxiety they come through the picture sounds and feelings but also if the environment is still tormenting them if the environment is still offering them negativity it's good to be able to teach people strategies to be able to set up some conditions that are going to make their life better and so that there's particular things they can do because they're worried about um, things like money health and relationships and so the environment is still now causing them pressure one way the environment is causing them pressure is through pictures and so either internal representations in their mind they're seeing pictures or out there they're receiving pictures if somebody's exhausted often giving them rituals where they close their eyes is going to help them to relax and to feel a lot better the top of the brain the whole visual cortex is the biggest part of the brain contains the most amount of neurons when people close their eyes and give themselves like a two to three minute break while they breathe it does help them to reset their energy so they can continue to move on throughout the day so any one of these techniques may not be enough to cure the person that's why we're going through each and all of the techniques one by one so when you put them together they become the cure for depression because the person's naturally happy until something interferes with that happiness either with their mind or with their body with their health with the story that's going on in their mind or the circumstances that are still occurring in their environment people are naturally happy until there's an interference to that happiness if it's not the environment like the light that's affecting a person sometimes it's the pictures in their own mind that become the symptom for anxiety or depression often people like when they close their eyes and they can see the stress or they can see the thing that's affecting them often they see it as far too close they see too much too close they're too crowded by getting them to do it an imagination exercise where they can basically in closing their eyes whatever it is that's in front of them getting them to move it slightly further away already their breathing usually starts to change when they can see the issue is just slightly further away and the breathing changes really great things tend to happen to that person straight away they start to relax they start to sometimes having their first experience in such a long time of ever feeling all that relaxed because you want to give them a positive experience so that you can continue stacking upon that positive experience so when it comes to sounds 
again, only 20% of people um, are primarily auditorial. When it comes to sounds, there's particular things you can control. You can get them to go into a place that's quiet. Like if they're overwhelmed, if their environment is still stacking and stacking the sounds on them, they're just getting overwhelmed by too much noise. Getting them into a quieter place can help. But if it's an internal representation of these sounds, like their own self-talk that's bugging them, there are other things that you can do. You can get them to control in their imagination the volume, the pace, the pitch. Get them to change the actual content, the actual words, if that makes sense. So if externally that the sounds are too much and they need to separate themselves, give themselves a boundary, give themselves five or ten minutes just somewhere, literally just a little bit quieter, it can help to relax them and help to improve their mood. But the other side is the internal again, to be able to change the internal representations of what's happening in the mind. So this could be the self-talk, this could be the awfulization, this could be the, oh, good grief, that people put at the end of each sentence. That it takes at least 12 seconds to feel happy. If people don't give themselves at least 12 seconds to accept joy when it comes, as in someone paid for lunch, and you go like, oh, thanks, but oh, I guess that I'm too poor to pay for it myself, they don't even then experience the joy of the free meal that they were just given if that makes sense, that it takes at least 12 seconds when good news, when something positive happens to somebody for them to feel good about it, to actually feel it. That's why it's so important to have positive self-talk. So next that we have feelings. And the feelings, this is a big one because like externally is often not the issue as in like are the walls <laughs> feel the wrong way or something or does the dog feel the wrong way or something. What they're talking about, basically, or what we're talking about when it comes to feelings, uh, internally and externally, is externally, it's to do with, like, muscle tension, tightness, um, basically, like, the brain telling the muscles to kind of go, safety is acquired when all the muscles are tight as possible. People need to be able to release those. And the first thing to do is to be able to release the stomach. When the stomach releases, it inflates with the in-breath, and then it deflates for the out breath. Let us know if you want the um, the recordings and the ebook, um, so like the MP3 recordings that we have for hypnotherapy that we use to actually help people to relax. Because we'll give you a link if you ask for it, and there's links to it in the um, the ebook as well. But tell us if you want the ebook that goes along with this entire course, because this is going to add so much value to your own joy, to your client's joy and knowing the exact techniques to be able to help people. So when a person's breathing, their stomach moves in and out. If their stomach is moving in and out rhythmically, the rest of their body starts to release as well. It's the first part of the body that they need to release. Then internal feelings, as in mood, emotions. Obviously people need a pretty good diet in order to not feel bad. Like if a dog is miserable, the vet usually asks, well, what are you feeding the dog? And so people's feelings are usually better when they're eating the right things. People want to check in on their energy levels. Is it time to sleep or is it time to be awake? But when it comes to their internal feelings, you can change a person's mood with a movie when they watch the, a movie. Like with um, Titanic, when you know Jack um, falls off that floating door, if people feel sad because of that, even though it's just an actor, it's because feelings are actually quite easy to change. When you change the story, you change the feelings. That's why movies tell stories to change your feelings. And then the last part that we're looking at on this is future imagination or imagination future. So this is like worry. This is more anxiety driven stuff than depression because people move between anxiety to depression. And so the way it works is that people tend to worry about these three things. People worry about how much money they have, even in bed after, you know, 12 o'clock at night when it's time to sleep. People worry about the health when there's nothing that they can do with the time because it's just bedtime. And people worry about relationships where there's nothing they can do with that time because it's just bedtime. So people are playing a story in their mind about lack or about what they don't have. The best time to work on money, health and relationships is when you have access to the tools to be able to do something about it. So let's say like, let's start with the money stuff. When it's bedtime, 
there's literally like nothing you can do. You're better off like writing out your thoughts or journal or getting a client to write and journal out their thoughts and then to pick up the battle the next day. It's the same as like if somebody is um, employed, they're often only employed for about, you know, like 40 hours of the week. But unemployed people feel unemployed for what is it, 168 in the week? For every hour of the week. So between nine to five, where most people tend to work, and I know other people have different shifts, nocturnal or weekends, but the 40 hours, nine to five, Monday to Friday, which was fairly standard, people who work only between nine to five, they're actually unemployed from five o'clock till 9 a.m. the next day. But they don't worry because they have a rhythm. They're working and then they're not. Then they're working and then they're not. When it comes to people who are unemployed, they don't feel unemployed from nine to five and then start feeling fine after 5 p.m. They worry about it the entire time. They don't let themselves off the hook after five o'clock. They don't have a rhythm. And this is an issue for them. That's how they can be depressed and anxious. It's because they don't have a rhythm of 9 a.m., resume time, get it out there. 5 p.m., who cares about money? 9 a.m., care about money again. 5 p.m., stop caring about money. Or if it's not employment, if it's business that you're in, 9 a.m., study marketing, improve upon it, get a coach. Um, we have programs that, in, again, like an ebook, tell us if you want the ebook, which has links to our, um, our business coaching programs. Like business is really, really great when, when people figure it out. Literally what business is, is thinking from the other person's point of view about what they want, making sure that you're out there telling people about it and working out your back ends, like working out how much you reasonably need to charge for something. That's all it is. So past the money stuff that people worry about is the health. Obviously, like the best time to work on health is when you can do something about it. So it's either see the GP for the illness or do the life plan to prevent the illness as best as possible. So the five things again that people need in order to create health is usually to breathe properly, sleep properly, hydrate properly, eat clean, and then exercise. And that's even the order in which they are important. So when it comes to like um, in the 80s, people used to teach this backwards. It used to be they'd say first go to the gym and they would teach going to the gym as a weight loss technique instead of going to the gym as an energy and fitness and strength building technique. You can shape your body at the gym, but it's not a weight loss tool for most people. The, one of the better weight loss tools, more urgently than, um, than exercising, is actually to eat clean. To make sure, like a, a friend of mine who basically said the three R's, um, can it rot? Uh, can you recognize what's in it? And did it roam? If it's no to all three, well then it's probably plastic, you know, it's probably like canned, it's probably packaged up junk food. That's just, it's really junk, not food. You wanna be putting into the body the things that are meant to go there. And then more urgently than eat clean is hydrate. People who don't hydrate, they can often um, develop cognitive disorders, um, they can lose up to 30% of their cognitive ability until they're hydrated again. The body needs water to be able to get rid of toxins, to flush itself. The body needs water to lubricate the blood system. The body needs water in order to be able to sweat when it needs to sweat. And it needs water to be able to regulate temperature. It basically, it needs water. Water is a really, really great health tool. And it's so much better than coffee or soft drinks. And more urgently than hydration is sleep. People who sleep around the eight to nine hours per day per cycle tend to do more for weight loss, more for health than the people who are even just focused on the exercise because sleep is more urgent and then breathing, which is more urgent again. So that's the external stuff. When it comes to health, what we're asking people to do is to stop worrying about it. We don't want them to have adrenal fatigue. We don't want them to stress and create an autoimmune disease so that when you're helping somebody to, um, to forget about it, what they need again, is just like with the money where we were talking about they need rhythm, they need to be on, then they need to be off is that when it comes to health, the best time to do something about health is the time they can do something about health. If people are lying in bed and they're worried about their weight, they're just stressing. And remember the pictures, sounds, and feelings. The symptoms of anxiety, again, are pictures, sounds, and feelings. For most people, it's either pictures or feelings. It's either that the picture is too close, they need to see it as further away. Or within their body, the more they worry about their weight, the more they worry about their health. The tighter all their muscles become and the worse they breathe. They need to learn to relax. 
And again, that's why you should let us know if you want the ebook that goes along with this free depression course, because it has links to, um, like, I mean, obviously the entire course and the material of this, but it has links where you can basically um, download our relaxation MP3s that we give to our clients to help them to sleep at night. It's the same ones I listen to myself. And then finally, and this is relationships. So there's the external and the internal. Again, external, how are the relationships going? And the internal, how do people feel about the relationships? Again, one of the best things to do about relationships is to stop worrying about them and only work on them at the times where you can actually work on them. When it's bedtime, it's time for sleep. It's not time for stressing about those things. There's one technique, which is the biggest and fastest jump starter for the external part of relationships, which is called the 20 minute gift. So if people are in a love relationship, a romantic relationship, one of the partners, as soon as they come home, they donate 20 minutes of their time to listening or serving their partner. And then 20 minutes later, the other person takes a turn of donating 20 minutes back. This helps people to be on the right page. Usually what's happening is that both people are trying to take the same 20 minutes at the same time. One is saying, I need your help. The other is saying, leave me alone. Or the other is saying, let's hang out. The other one saying, leave me alone. <laughs> if that makes sense. And so people need in relationships to be able to spend a little bit of time reconnecting with what does the other person want and then to be able to receive that back. What does the other person want back? So thank you so much for being a part of this training. We're going to go into so much more depth and just to give you a bit of a preview about what's happening next week. These are all the training modules and the training frameworks. So just zooming into this one, um, how to cure depression. So this is a map that I draw for every single client that I see. There's a reason that we draw this map for them because it's one that really represents how to change what's going on on the inside of somebody's mind. Um, because if people don't know this stuff, it becomes very, very difficult for them to be able to change habits. Depression is something that you can treat. Depression is something that doesn't have to be there. If a person's body is healthy, and if the story inside the person's mind is positive, and they're saying the right things to themselves, they know about the symptoms of the pictures, sounds, and feelings. Plus, they have a rhythm of when they're working on their external things, such as like money, health, and relationships, then often they tend to be fairly happy. It's the default, sorry, default state. So thanks again for being a part of this training. And so make sure that you look out for the next training as it becomes available, because we love delivering this stuff to you guys, that it's when we teach our clients who are depressed this stuff, it really makes a difference in their life. Never underestimate the value of educating a person on how their own mind works, because that's how they become set free. That's how they become happier. That's how they find themselves actually being in control. Like imagine again, like they're in a car holding the steering wheel. They can see perfectly well through the windscreen. If they can't see, <laughs> then there's not a lot of control to be had. But once they can see the road, once they can see the controls, once they can analyze themselves and go, ah, oh, finally, that's what was going on with me, then they're ready to really receive that joy. So thank you again for being a part of this training. And so again, watching out for the training as it becomes available, We'll see you next time.